Good afternoon, and welcome to UCF Coastal's Lunch on the Coast speaker series. I'm Dr. Graham Worthy, Director of UCF Coastal. Through this speaker series, I hope you gain appreciation for the extent of basic and applied coastal research underway here at UCF. Orlando may be an inland city, but we still contribute to the issues facing our coast and are in turn impacted by those same issues. One of the goals of UCF Coastal is to grow public awareness about the amazing coastal resources we frequently take for granted. To achieve that goal, we've assembled an incredible team of cutting-edge researchers who serve as a resource for everyone from marine scientists to the general public, businesses, and policymakers. Our Lunch on the Coast speaker series is running from July through December, with one speaker each month. Through this series, we're proud to highlight some of the recent research undertaken by the diverse interdisciplinary faculty of UCF Coastal. You'll learn what it really means to live in a coastal state with expert perspectives ranging from archaeology to coastal planning, from engineering and economics to eco ecosystem and human health. You'll get an appreciation for the full range of issues currently facing our coasts and the resources that UCF Coastal is bringing to bear to help foster an understanding of those threats and hopefully chart a path forward. Now let me pass you over to our moderator who will be introducing you to this month's speaker and we'll also be running our question and answer session following the talk. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the Lunch on the Coast speaker series. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Emmerich, UCF Coastal's Director of Research, and I'm here as your moderator for today's Lunch on the Coast speaker series. It is my great honor to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Lisa Chambers. Dr. Chambers is an associate professor of biology in UCF's Department of Biology, and she also holds a secondary joint appointment with UCF Coastal. Dr. Chambers' particular research interests and expertise centers on biogeochemical cycling in the environment. In more simple terms, Dr. Chambers studies the exchange of elements like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus between the soil, the water, and the air in an effort to understand more about ecosystem resilience. Today, Dr. Chambers will introduce us to some of these processes currently occurring in our coastal areas, how these processes are important for our planet's overall health, and how they uh, may result in outcomes, both positive and negative, for coastal areas. In this short video, uh, we will see just a glimpse into Dr. Chambers' research on our coastal systems. I got interested in wetlands when I was an undergraduate researcher. I walked into my first swamp like this and it's so cool, the water reaches up into your boots, uh, the climate starts to get a little cooler because of all the shade, and it's just a magical feeling being someplace that nobody else gets to go or rarely wants to go. My name is Lisa Chambers and I study how natural ecosystems can store carbon and cycle nutrients. Right now we're in a cypress dome at the UCF Arboretum and we're taking a look at the amount of carbon that's stored in these soils. It's really important for ecosystems to store carbon because it helps pull it out of our atmosphere. First it comes in as plants and biomass and then it gets buried in the soil. And when the soil is wet, that carbon tends to remain there for long periods of time. Natural ecosystems can store huge amounts of carbon in them, particularly wetlands. We found through a study here at UCF that wetlands store approximately 16 times more carbon than upland ecosystems. In fact, there's so much carbon in the UCF Arboretum that the storage here is equivalent to approximately 800 million miles of CO2 released by a car uh, driving around town. Learning how important this is to all ecosystem processes makes me feel like I'm contributing something important to our general knowledge. Should you have any questions or comments during Dr. Chambers' presentation, please use the Q&A button. It's located at the bottom of the, uh, the panel on your screen. Here you can ask questions that we'll cover later during a uh, later part of the lunch session. Due to an unforeseen conflict today, Lisa's talk has been pre-recorded. 
She will be joining us uh, live for the Q&A portion. So as the talk begins, I still encourage you to submit your questions um, in the, in the Q&A below. You can also upvote your favorite questions and move them closer to the top so that they're more likely to be answered by Dr. Chambers. Now, without further ado, please sit back and enjoy Dr. Chambers' presentation. Lisa, thanks for being here and sharing with us today. Hi, thank you so much for that great introduction and thank you all for having given me the opportunity to come and speak to you today. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person to give this presentation, but I'm very excited to take live uh, questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let's put it in presentation. All right. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is carbon, soil carbon in the coast. And I titled my talk, Coastal Soil Carbon Feast or Famine, because carbon, despite us hearing so much about it in terms of global climate change, is actually a food source. All right, so if we're looking at soil carbon, uh, my more scientific title of my talk would be Leveraging Coastal Ecosystems for Carbon Sequestration and Climate Mitigation. And so this first slide is just kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today. First, I'm going to go into a background, talk a little bit about myself and why I study MUD. Um, case studies looking at the intersection of global change, coasts, and carbon. Specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about sea level rise and coastal wetland submergence marsh to mangrove transitions, as well as oyster reef restoration, and conclude with a little bit of ideas about looking ahead in my research program, as well as what you could do to help with the uh, feast part of the carbon so that our coastlines don't famine. All right, so a little bit about myself. I started way up north uh, in the top of the watershed, and I did my undergraduate degree at Ohio State University, and that is where I got interested in wetlands. Um, in particular, there was a big created wetland complex called the Olentangy River Complex, as well as a big mesocosm facility, and that's where I first got my feet wet. Um, and then I followed that dream of studying mud and wetlands downstream down to coastal Louisiana. And I did my master's degree at LSU, looking at some of the Mississippi River diversions. And then realized after that, that really the mecca for soil carbon in the United States has got to be Florida. We have so many wetlands here that this is really the place to be. And so I moved on and got my PhD at the University of Florida. And you'll notice in all these pictures, I am constantly going around <laughs> poking holes and collecting mud. And now finally, I have landed at the University of Central Florida, which I'm really happy to be here as part of the coastal cluster, where I can really start to get my feet wet and dig into the mud uh, and all of the amazing ecosystems around Florida. So let's talk about mud. What is mud? Now, you might think it's pretty simple. You take some soil, you add some water, you get mud. Well, sort of, but honestly, if you just take sandy soil and add water, you just get wet water or wet sand, right? So if we really want to get mud, I mean really good mud, we have to have certain ecosystem conditions. In particular, good mud requires a persistence of really wet conditions for long periods of time and the key ingredient of lots and lots of organic matter. Organic matter you can think of as anything that used to be alive. And in the context of this talk, I'm talking mainly about plant material and dead plant biomass. So this leads to wetlands. Wetlands are very unique ecosystems. Um, they're unique in the sense that for one, they possess water, so they're always wet, but they're different than lakes and streams and rivers, right? Um, rather than a deep water lake, wetlands are very unique in the sense that they have rooted vegetation in them. And so you can see that it's rooted in the ground and so it's shallow enough that that vegetation can remain rooted and then grow up through the water column. So they're very diverse in terms of the types of different wetlands you can have from something like this kind of uh, floating leaved system 
into cypress stones, which we see a lot here in central Florida, salt marshes. This is from an uh, area outside of Jacksonville, right there on the coast. Riverine wetlands. This picture was taken in the Kissimmee River Basin. And here's a picture from Big Cypress uh, Preserve, and you can see uh, forested areas. But again, all of these pictures have these key characteristics, right? So we have the presence of water, but that water is either shallow enough or at least recedes for part of the year so that we can, can maintain this rooted vegetation. And then, of course, the thing that I study that you can't see so well in these pictures is the fact that because of the water and the plants, we get these really unique wetland soils. So wetland soils uh, and wetlands in general are sinks, which means basically simply as a product of their position with the landscape being in kind of low lying areas um, that we tend to see these wetlands have many different constituents from the upland environment that flow into them and collect there. Um, so basically, whether it's water, sediment, or nutrients, it's all flowing upland, it's getting trapped in the wetland, and because now all of a sudden we have all of the perfect ingredients for productivity, they produce massive amounts of biomass, primary production. And how this relates to the carbon cycle is, if you remember back to early biology classes, the way that plant material and biomass is formed is through the sequestration of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? The process of photosynthesis is um, utilizing light and water energy and taking CO2 from the atmosphere and converting it into solid carbon, biomass, carbohydrates, sugars, things like that within the plant. So now we have our CO2, it's moved from the atmosphere into our plant biomass. But unfortunately, all great things must die and these plants don't live forever. So when plants die and turn into litter, that litter material ultimately has a couple different potential fates. It typically senesces and falls to the soil surface. And now all of a sudden it's really up to the soils to determine whether or not that sequestered carbon is going to remain in our kind of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems or if it's going to be released back into the atmosphere. And this is really important because all of that biomass is so rich in carbon. It's estimated that on average, plant biomass is about 55% pure carbon. So let's look a little bit closer at those soils because what's going on in that soil is really going to determine whether or not that carbon, again, remains buried in those terrestrial ecosystems or gets re-released back into the atmosphere and just cycles back into CO2. So if we take a microscope and we look really closely at that soil, it turns out that there is incredible amounts of life in it. They estimate that within a single gram of soil, so that's about the amount you can pinch between two fingers, there's about 40 million bacteria, million. So we have all of these diverse microbiota within the soil. And what they're doing is basically respiring and surviving just like we do. So these microbes are typically aerobes, just like we are, which means they're going to inhale oxygen and use that as their terminal electron acceptor. They're gonna utilize that dead plant litter and that biomass and that organic matter as their energy source or their electron donor. And in the process, just like us, when we exhale, we release CO2 and water vapor. So essentially they're completing that cycle. The CO2 comes in, forms biomass, biomass falls on the soil surface, the microbes eat it, break it back down and release it back into the atmosphere as CO2. And as a result, in normal terrestrial ecosystems, we don't see a ton of organic material in our soil. It's pretty quickly respired back into the atmosphere as CO2. And that results in our kind of pure white sands that we often see here in Florida as well. Now, take that same microbial consortia and put it in a wetland, and all of a sudden, it is underwater, right? And these microbes are now restricted from oxygen that they need to breathe. 
Um, oxygen is something that doesn't move through water very easily. It moves through water about 10,000 times slower than it does through air. And so these microbes in this water basically serves as kind of a cap on, on the microbial system. And so they become limited in oxygen. And when they have limited oxygen, they do a couple different things. Um, one thing is that they simply just don't breathe as much. Um, another thing is that they can evolve alternative pathways for respiration. These are what we call alternative electron acceptors. And it turns out that these microbes have evolved over time all kinds of really unique pathways that allow them to survive. I'm not going to get into that too much with this talk, but the basic idea here is when these soils are flooded, they're using much more energy inefficient pathways in order to respire. And so the rate at which they do so gets slower and slower and slower. And if they're not breaking down that organic material and cycling it back up into the atmosphere, it starts to accumulate at deeper and deeper and deeper within the soil itself. And so this is why wetlands bury carbon, right? So our productivity rates are significantly greater than our decomposition rates. And we end up with these huge accumulations of carbon um, like you've seen in my introductory video. So how much carbon can wetland soils store? Well, it turns out a lot. So if we think about carbon, again, we hear a lot about carbon in our atmosphere and how CO2 is a greenhouse gas that's contributing to global warming. But it turns out in terms of active carbon pools, so this is like carbon that can cycle within the matter of our lifetimes, only about 17% of that actively cycling carbon is actually present in the atmosphere. A much larger percent is within the biomass that's represented here in green, some in the surface ocean, but the vast amount of that carbon is actually stored in our soils, about half of it. What's even more amazing is that wetlands alone account for about 16% of our actively cycled carbon pool. Now, 16% is an exceptional amount when you consider that only about five or 6% of our entire land surface is covered with wetlands. So a much uh, disproportionately large amount of carbon storage in these ecosystems relative to their aerial extent. So to kind of put this into even more perspective, we've done a lot of research here on the UCF campus Turns out this is a fantastic place to study wetlands. We have seven different types of wetlands on campus, and we've done lots of our research simply uh, collecting soils right here. One of the areas that we love to study is what we call the Bayhead Swamp, and it's located on the northern side of campus near Lake Clare. There's a huge peat deposit there in that wetland, and my undergraduate student pictured here, Jennifer Bennett, was heavily involved in a bunch of research that looked at soil carbon reservoirs on UCF's campus. In this one little core she's holding, it's about 50 centimeters long. We've done some analysis and found out that it's about 80% water, because it's a very wet system, about 20% solid. Of these solid materials within this core, about 86% of it is organic, and roughly 55% of all of that organic material is pure carbon. So if you actually calculate out the density of this one particular core and look at it in terms of CO2 equivalents, this one little core holds approximately 250 grams of carbon or 18 pounds of CO2. So you can see how this becomes a really important aspect of our climate cycle. What's really cool though is that particular wetland, that bayhead swamp on campus, it doesn't just go down 50 centimeters, it actually goes down 500 centimeters. There is five meters of peat in that particular wetland on campus. And if you look at this bar chart here at the bottom, not only is there lots of carbon in it, but the density of the carbon actually gets greater as you go deeper and deeper. So this is one of the things I alluded to in that introductory video is this idea that uh, here on campus we have huge amounts of carbon, over 85,000 megagrams of carbon on campus. It's equivalent to the amount of CO2 produced by a car driving around town um, 776 million miles. 
um, and that's stored right here in our soils on campus. So one final thing about how important water really is to carbon storage. This is my great, uh, one of my favorite examples is looking at the Everglades agricultural area. So if you're familiar with this region, it's just south of Lake Okeechobee. It was drained in the 1920s for agricultural purposes. They put a levee around the southern part of Lake Okeechobee so it could no longer flow into the greater Everglades system. And it was uh, basically drained a previous wetland for agriculture. And because they introduced oxygen to this area of soil that previously didn't have any oxygen, all of a sudden the microbes in there started to respire really, really fast. And incredibly, um, some researchers had the foresight to put in a subsidence post, and that's what's pictured here in white. At the time in the 1920s, they drove this post down to bedrock, and the very top of that post was at the soil surface. So everything that you're seeing exposed is actually soil that has been lost to microbial respiration since that time. And me being kind of a soil dork, uh, I was really excited when I got to go and get my picture next to this subsidence post. You can see another picture of a famous soil scientist down here at the bottom from the 60s. And you can see how rapidly that soil is being oxidized. Uh, and another kind of great visual of how important oxygen is to soil carbon burial and how much it can accelerate the loss of that soil carbon is down below this uh, image of the house. I always like to quiz students, what do you think that cement box is next to the house? Well, it turns out that's their septic, septic system. Uh, this house used to not have stairs. It used to sit right there on the soil surface, but all of that soil has been oxidized through microbial respiration once that wetland was drained. Okay. So now that you're convinced that wetlands are very important carbon sinks, particularly in the soil, let's move on to the coast. And I want to talk to you today about three different case studies of research that we're doing in the coastal zone that study blue carbon ecosystems. So blue carbon is kind of a fancy new term that scientists use to really hit home this idea that coastal ecosystems store really large amounts of carbon. Blue carbon ecosystems are considered anything um, at the coastal zone that is dominated by photosynthesizers. So we have marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds as kind of our classic blue carbon ecosystems. And this famous paper by McLeod really hit home as to why we should care about specifically these, the carbon stored in these coastal ecosystems is that the carbon sequestration rate in salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses is substantially higher than even that in other types of forest, even tropical rainforest. So this has brought a lot of attention to these ecosystems as a mechanism to mitigate climate change and protect um, our carbon stores. Now, as they are located on the coastal zone, these blue carbon ecosystems are very vulnerable to climate change. It is, uh, we've seen uh, sea levels rising throughout time. You can see here in this graph, since post-industrial revolution, we've seen a, a pretty steady increase in sea level. At first, it was about two millimeters per year. In more recent times, it's accelerated to be about three, 3.2 millimeters per year as the global average. So we may disagree about all the reasons that sea level is rising, but we have plenty of empirical evidence to suggest that it most definitely is. And the concern with this is that many scientists believe that due to the rise in sea levels, these coastal ecosystems, these blue carbon ecosystems, are extremely vulnerable to loss. Depending on who you talk to and uh, what studies you look at, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the global area of coastal wetlands in particular are predicted to be lost by the end of this century. So let's talk about how coastal wetlands are able to respond to sea level rise. Well, it turns out that these ecosystems do have a natural ability to migrate along the landscape. So in many kind of low-lying, low-disturbance areas, like this one pictured here in the edge of the uh, coastal Everglades, what we see is these very 
consistent and unique vegetation zones that tend to develop based on these different species tolerance to inundation and salinity. Now, as the sea level rises, they maintain that optimal position within the tidal frame simply by slowly and gradually moving further and further inland. And we see this uh, fairly consistently um, in various, again, areas that have low topographic gradients and low disturbance. They've got to have a large seed bank and they've got to have sea level rising at a rate slow enough that that vegetation just can kind of shift within the tidal frame. The other key idea here in order for landward migration to be a way that we can preserve our coastal wetlands is that there can't be any development right behind those wetlands. If somebody builds a condo there, all of a sudden we have what we call coastal squeeze where the sea level is rising, there's nowhere for the wetlands to go and their area gets shrunk smaller and smaller. Now, another cool thing about wetlands is they do have a natural capacity to uh, accrete vertically in response to sea level. So essentially, as the sea level rises, it increases the inundation rate on the marsh itself. And as those more intense waves and the deeper wave energy comes onto the marsh platform, it deposits nutrient-rich mineral sediments. And this actually helps to fuel additional plant growth. And as that additional plant growth occurs, it produces more and more organic matter, both as a litter and as root biomass. And the elevation actually accretes vertically in the tidal frame. And so the wetland can maintain its uh, position in the tidal frame and just grow to match that sea level rise. And there's actually a lot of studies that again show that this is uh, a very viable natural mechanism, uh, a response that these ecosystems have to natural variabilities in sea level. But again, it has to be in a fairly low disturbance type of area where there's not a whole lot of human intervention, there's adequate nutrients and sediment to help that plant productivity, and oftentimes it works best in areas with larger tidal ranges to kind of bring that material up onto the marsh platform. And then our third potential response to sea level, looking here in the center there, is submergence. So if the first two don't work out, this, the coastal systems aren't able to migrate or accrete vertically, we often see submergence. And these are in highly disturbed areas, areas that have adjacent development, any sort of kind of human impact that prohibits them from naturally responding to sea levels. Oftentimes systems with low sediment supplies and low tidal ranges are also more susceptible to submergence. So this leads into my first case study, which is looking at submergence along the coastal marsh edge. And for this one, I wanna take you to Louisiana and specifically Barataria Bay, Louisiana, which is on the southern side of the Mississippi River. Now, if you've heard anything about Louisiana, it has really high rates of land loss. Here in Louisiana, the rate of sea level rise, that's what's indicated here, relative sea level rise, is not 3.2 like the world average. It's about 10 millimeters per year. And similar to lots of areas of Florida, they have a very low topographic gradient. And so these small increases in sea level end up being massive loss of land. The reasons for this are, are many and complicated. A lot of it has to do with uh, the geology of the area because it is a deltaic plain that naturally subsides over time. Some of it is due to some anthropogenic uh, impacts within that area. But the bottom line is, Louisiana has been losing land for a long period of time, and we're talking about a lot of land. For a period, they were losing approximately a football field of land every day. They've lost well over the size of uh, the state of Rhode Island. Um, and what we wanted to understand is what happens to all of that carbon in those wetland soils when they undergo this submergence. So that was the subject of an NSF grant that we got funded. And what I'm gonna be presenting next is some work that was led by my previous PhD student, Dr. Havlin Stein Mueller. And we looked at this question of what happens when these marshes erode into the surrounding bay. In particular, what happens to all of that carbon stored in the soil? 
So we've seen through lots of evidence, really high rates of edge erosion along these coastal Louisiana marshes, such as you can see in this picture here. And as this marsh material collapses into the surrounding bay, we wanted to understand better what is its fate? Does it simply fall into the bay and just kind of get buried in the aquatic ecosystem? Or because the bay water tends to be a little bit more oxygenated, there's a lot more churning of the water with wave action and, and atmospheric uh, oxygen getting in there. Could there actually be an opportunity for oxygen to meet up with this eroded soil and promote microbial respiration where it's converted back into CO2? Um, along with all this carbon, of course, there's lots of other nutrients. And if you've heard about Louisiana, they have an issue called the dead zone where they've got lots of excess nitrogen in particular that's promoting uh, hypoxic conditions. So we also wanted to understand the relationship of this to hypoxia. So we did a fairly simple uh, lab incubation experiment where Haviland went out to three different sites in coastal Louisiana and collected long cores about a meter deep each. And we brought them back to the lab, we sectioned them into small sections so that we were able to see how soils at all of those depth segments from the surface down to 100 uh, centimeters reacted to increased exposure to oxygenated water, like what happens when the marsh uh, erodes into the bay. So we did these incubations. We incubated those soils with either oxygenated bay water or in an anaerobic system that's more akin to um, a wetland or an intact wetland platform. And what we found was really interesting. So this graph is looking at potential soil respiration rates. And on the x-axis, we have the different depths of the soil. On the y-axis, we have the rate at which CO2 is released through that microbial respiration. And as you can see, this, this graph is showing the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. So how much it increased with the oxygenated water compared to when it was in a, a situation similar to the marsh platform. And you can see that in every single depth segment, there was a significant increase in the amount of soil respiration and microbial activity in that soil. But what was really fascinating to us was when you went deeper than about 40 centimeters, the rate uh, actually increased substantially. So it turned out that the deep wetland soils were actually more responsive to that oxygenated environment than the surface soils. And this was interesting because most scientists think about surface soils as being the ones that are kind of globally active, globally reactive, um, have the best nutrients and chemical composition for microbes to be able to utilize and respire. And many people assume that the deeper you go, that those soils are kind of inactive um, and kind of well-preserved. But our research actually showed the exact opposite. At uh, 90 to 100 centimeters deep, there was four times greater stimulation of microbial respiration than in our surface soils. And as we looked at these soils a little bit uh, more intensely, we noticed that not only uh, are they responding to oxygen at deep depths, but the reservoirs of both carbon and nutrients also tended to be much greater at depth. And this becomes important because what we find in these coastal systems that are eroding is that it's not just the soil surface that's eroding. Approximately one to two meters of the soil platform is actually breaking off and going into the bay. So the take home message from this particular case study is that based on this data, it appears that the vast majority of the carbon within these wetland soils is actually undergoing microbial mineralization or respiration when it gets broken up and released into the bay. Now, what happens to all of the CO2 that the microbes are producing? Well, some of it fluxes right back into the atmosphere as kind of a climate change feedback. But some of it also might remain dissolved in the water itself. And this can actually contribute to things like ocean acidification. And although I don't go into it in detail for this talk, all of that nitrogen and phosphorus in that soil is also being released into the bay. So this study was really interesting because the marshes were eroding so rapidly. Um, in this particular aerial photograph, this is one of our studies. 
And what I have uh, marked here in red are some of our transects that we are measuring the rate of erosion along these marshes. And these transects were put out that furthest pole that you see there was actually at the marsh edge three years ago when the study started. And this was data that was collected by our collaborators at LSU. Um, Yadav, uh, Sap Krakota, and John White collected this data. They found that on average, the erosion rate on these islands in Louisiana was about 1.4 meters per year, and that about 150 centimeters of the profile was being released into the bay. They also dated these soils and found that that represents about 850 years worth of carbon accumulation. So moving on to our second case study, another thing that we're seeing a lot in the coastal zone as it relates to soil carbon is major shifts in vegetation communities. We're seeing these uh, clear zonation patterns, like I discussed earlier, shifting uh, across the landscape as a result of sea level rise. Um, this middle photo here is mangrove propagules. So in coastal Louisiana, what we're seeing is mangroves encroaching further and further inland along with the increase in sea levels. And so we're starting to see them uh, propagate along those tidal creeks as they move further inland. And throughout the entire area, particularly up here in central Florida, we're seeing the zonation and the prevalence of mangroves increase. So mangroves are a coastal species that is typically limited in its distribution based on temperature tolerances. It's not tolerant to freeze events. But because our temperatures have been warming and our freeze events are becoming less and less frequent, we're starting to see mangroves further and further north. And now we have mangroves, uh, at least sparse mangroves, all the way up to the border of uh, Georgia. So we wanted to understand how do these shifts in vegetation communities impact soil carbon storage? And in particular, the first study I'm going to show you is done out in Kennedy Space Center, where we have um, on the upland edge of the marsh, uh, Disticula spicata, which is known as salt grass. And we have mangroves encroaching along the shoreward edge of the marsh. So these mangroves are in a more inundated, higher salinity type of environment. And if we look solely at total soil carbon storage along this transect, what we found was that actually the salt grass further upstream or further upslope had greater soil carbon than the mangroves. Now this was a little bit unexpected. Um, because much of the previous research suggests that at least in terms of above ground biomass, mangroves actually store a lot more carbon in their above ground biomass than marshes. So many researchers have published research suggesting that mangrove encroachment might actually be a net positive in terms of carbon storage in coastal ecosystems. This particular study suggested that actually mangroves are storing less carbon in the soil than their um, marsh counterparts. And if we look at our specific study site there at Kennedy Space Center, this is really important because they've estimated through other research that about 69% of, uh, there's been a 69% increase in black mangrove coverage in only seven years in this particular region. So the mangroves are really taking over, but based on what we found, at least the young mangroves that are just starting to establish are storing less soil carbon than the previous marsh community. So we wanted to look at this a little bit further, and this is research that was done by my uh, recently defended master student, Sarah Hartan. We wanted to understand a little bit more, well, is this true across the landscape? Are we consistently seeing this effect of shifting patterns in carbon storage based on the transition from marsh to mangrove? And so for her research, which was funded by the USDA, we looked at three unique river systems on the west coast of Florida. So moving up or starting by, in the north by Tampa, we looked at the Little Manatee River, um, down by Charlotte Harbor, the Peace River, and then down in the Everglades, the Fakahatchee River. And again, we did a transect. We had a marsh site and a mangrove end member and then a transition site, and we measured soil carbon. And in a paper that Sarah recently published, you can see here that 
Well, there is no pattern, right? So we look at Little Manatee River on that particular location. If we look again, just at soil carbon concentrations, we had the most soil carbon in the marsh and the least in the mangrove. If we look at the Peace River, we saw the opposite trend. We had the most soil carbon in our mangrove sites and the least in our marsh sites. And then finally in the Fakahatchee River, we had roughly the same, maybe a little bit less soil carbon uh, at, the mar at the mangrove site. So what this tells us is we need to do a lot more research. Um, it turns out that this marsh to mangrove uh, transition, the encroachment of mangroves, it's not producing any sort of really consistent pattern that we can give to managers and say, yeah, you know, if marsh, if uh, your marshes get replaced by mangroves, your carbon storage is either going to increase or decrease. It's very much site dependent. We think it has a lot to do with how old the mangroves are. So maybe when they're young, they're not producing or storing as much carbon, but as they mature, they might do so. Um, other factors that might come into play here in this site specificity are the amount of energy that each of these systems experiences in terms of erosion, as well as sediment deposition of mineral sediments, which dilutes the organic carbon in the sediment. And now finally, moving to something slightly different, moving away from the vegetated ecosystems, I also want to talk to you about something that's um, a little less on the radar of mainstream research which is this idea that in addition to blue carbon ecosystems, that other coastal ecosystems may actually be storing significant carbon as well. And in particular, what I'm talking about here is oyster reefs. So if you're familiar with the Mosquito Lagoon area um, around New Smyrna Beach and that, that region, um, this is where this research was done. And the area was historically dominated by significant quantities of oyster reefs. Over time, um, many of these oyster reefs have been lost, but the reefs themselves and what the oysters do is basically they're filter feeders. So they filter out phytoplankton and various particulate matter from the water column. They consume what they can, and then they release in the form of what they call biodeposits, which is like feces and pseudo feces, this kind of nutrient rich, organic rich material. And that is what you're seeing here in the bottom of this uh, oyster cluster is this kind of really mucky, dark material that turns out to be really rich in carbon. So some of our research looks at how long it takes for uh, restoration to increase carbon burial in sediments. So specifically, we're talking about oyster reef restoration. And this is research that we've done in collaboration with Linda Walter's lab, the Coastal and Estuarine Ecology Lab here at UCF. They have been doing oyster reef restoration upwards of uh, a decade here in the Mosquito Lagoon area. They take these dead reefs, which are pretty much just piles of loose shell. Oftentimes, it's, this is attributed to boat wakes. Uh, they rake down the shells, they put out um, mats that are secured to the ground with oyster shells that they collected from local restaurants, and this actually attracts spat and allows the oyster reef to regrow in a much more uh, solid and well-established base um, for the restoration effort. So we got out there and we were interested in understanding how the restoration efforts that these people are doing are affecting the ability of oyster reefs to uh, bury and sequester carbon in the sediments. And first of all, I want you to look at the number of live oysters. So this is a, a study that we did where we looked at reefs that were either still dead, so no live oysters. They'd been restored one year ago, four years ago, or seven years ago. And then we had live references. Uh, so these were like control reefs that were still in pristine condition, not impacted by humans. And if we look at these and the amount of oysters on these um, plots, you can see that plotted here. But if we look at our carbon concentrations, it turns out that dead reefs don't have a ton of total carbon on them. But as soon as they've been restored, within just one year, there is a huge spike in carbon concentration. And what was really interesting for us was the fact that we saw such a giant spike in carbon concentration, despite the fact that the oyster biomass or the number of live oysters was still significantly less than some of those older oysters. 
So this was kind of an interesting finding that led to additional research. Uh, this was stuff that was done by a previous master's student, Brian Losher, and he wanted to understand if it could have something to do with the fact that new oyster reefs were dominated by young oysters. And so he did this tank experiment where he put the oysters in funnels, put them in tanks with water from the field, and allowed them to filter feed and then collected that biodeposition that they have. And what you're seeing here is dissolved organic carbon contents. And the juvenile oysters, so ones that are less than a year old, actually had significantly higher concentrations of dissolved organic carbon in their biodeposits compared to older oysters. And so we think that one of the reasons we see such a rapid response of sediment carbon pools underneath these restored oyster reefs is because the physiology of the juvenile oysters means that they're filter feeding more rapidly and they're also releasing more of that nutrient rich and carbon rich biodeposition into the surrounding sediments. So as a take home message for this one, oyster reef respiration can rapidly increase sedimentary carbon pools and young oysters tend to be really good at fast filter feeding and the deposition of lots of nutrients and carbon. So I'm gonna wrap up here by talking very briefly about some of the ongoing research that we're doing in our lab. We are continuing to try and understand the mechanisms that regulate soil carbon storage in wetlands. And my newest uh, PhD student, Anthony Marabito, is doing a bunch of work on what we call mineral associated organic matter to try and get a better feel for the role that minerals play in helping keep carbon in the soil for longer periods of time. So that's one of our, our new research thrust areas. And then finally, to talk about, you know, listening to this presentation, learning all about how important wetlands and soil carbon storage is. Many people always ask me, you know, what can I do to help, to help out? Um, and my response would be, keep it wet and give it space. So a lot of times uh, wetlands, you know, the most important thing is to keep that water on them. So whenever development occurs, even if it's just in the vicinity of wetlands to make sure that the hydrology is not disrupted, that that water uh, remains there and the hydro period remains what it used to be so that that soil does not oxidize. And then the other kind of key lesson that I've learned over the years is this idea that we need to stop thinking about um, trying to keep coastal ecosystems in the status quo. You know, there, there is no status quo. Nature is naturally dynamic. They're going to change. Rather than fighting it or putting a value on it, it's important to just let these ecosystems respond because they're actually extremely resilient and have many natural mechanisms that allow them to respond to sea level if given the opportunity and, you know, a lack of, of human intervention and disturbance. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end my presentation. You can see my email address here, um, and I'm happy to take questions now as well as um, via email afterwards. So thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Chambers, for uh, that. Hey, Dr. Chambers is, is back with us. Thank you for that uh, recorded um, presentation. It was it kept us on our toes, lots of different places, lots of different things to learn. And several questions have come in uh, during your presentation. Uh, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes trying to get through as many of these as we can. I have taken some, some artistic liberty in combining these questions in various ways. Um, the first question is, um, how do researchers estimate 40 million bacteria within a gram of soil? What methods were used or equipment to determine that? Yeah, isn't that an amazing statistic? I love giving that statistic to people. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that we can we can quantify soil uh, organic or microbial biomass. Um, one of the ways is by looking at biomass. So we do this in our lab regularly. We do these assays where we take soil and we actually expose them to chloroform. And this causes all of the microbial cells in the soil to actually lice or break open and releases that carbon into solution. And then we can quantify the amount of carbon in that sample that has the lysed cells, compare it to a sample that has intact cells, and measure the actual biomass of those microbes. Um, more recently, people are starting to use DNA and actually 
uh, extract DNA from soils. They can very easily, with all kinds of fancy new equipment I don't know that much about, they're able to quantify um, the amount of DNA and then convert that into the amount of microbes in the soil. Awesome. That's definitely way above my pay grade as far as understanding this stuff. So um, the next two questions are related to vegetation itself. I've combined a couple of them. So I'm going to ask both of them and then you can try to answer them maybe uh, together or separate. Are mangroves better than cord grasses in sequencing carbon? And then the second kind of similar question, curious about net carbon with mangroves below and above ground. Is this net of mangroves equal below or above salt grass net? So. Yeah. And this is, this is a lot of the stuff I was trying to get at in my presentation because this is the huge question, right? Like we have mangroves encroaching everywhere. We see these major differences and changes in our coastal ecosystems. And everybody wants to know, you know, is this good? Is this bad? You know, what are the repercussions of it? Um, and hopefully some of my data that I showed you gets at this idea that it's one of those really complicated things, right? Um, so we have really consistent evidence that suggests uh, that above ground biomass is higher in mangroves. And you can just think about that logically. You know, trees hold more biomass uh, in woody vegetation. They don't senesce like herbaceous cord grass and things like that do on a seasonal basis. And so above ground biomass definitely does seem to be higher in mangroves. And this is important for a variety of reasons. Beyond just carbon storage, that above ground biomass serves as kind of like a buffer for storm surges and things like that. So that helps trap sediments. It's the below ground components that is really uncertain. So, you know, based on the data we found, we've seen, we've seen the whole gamut of things. We've seen places where mangroves accelerate um, above ground or below ground carbon storage, places where it's lower, places where it's not that different. Um, it depends on how old the mangroves are. I think when they're first establishing, you know, it takes a while before that reservoir starts to build up. It depends on the hydrology of that specific site. It depends on energy. We have one system where it seems like um, erosion because it's right along a, a river channel is actually pulling carbon out of the soil even though there's mangroves there. So um, I wish I had a great answer for you, but it's one of those things where at this point, we're just trying to figure out what does regulate it because it is extremely variable. All right, well, leaves more work for the future for sure. Um, the next question, kind of similar, is there a difference between the levels of carbon stored in interior wetlands versus the salt marshes? Okay, so um, I'm not sure. Interior can mean like inland non-coastal wetlands or it could mean just kind of away from the tidal frame. Um, so I would say if we're talking just within the coastal zone, interior from, from the edge, we often see a really high accumulation of organic matter. It all depends on how wet the system is, right? So water is the key ingredient there. So when you get further and further away from the coast and you still have those marshy areas, the tides will come in and then they'll just kind of sit there. And this can help to create really large carbon reservoirs a little bit further away from the coastal zone. Um, sometimes that, that can become vulnerable as well. But oftentimes on the coastal zone, those interior ones have a little bit more and less of that mineral sediment that the edge wetlands have. Um, if we're talking about uh, inland wetlands, then they run the whole gamut. You know, it all depends on hydrology. The more consistently they're wet, typically the more carbon they produce. Okay, um, thank you for that. The questions continue to roll in. I'm trying to do my best. We have just a few minutes left. Um, the next questions are more possibly speculative uh, guidance questions. Um, is it possible to encourage or make a wetland area in a non-wetland area? And what would that look like and what would it be? Yeah, I mean, so people do this. A lot of times it's done for purposes of mitigation. Like if you destroy a wetland, you have to go and construct a wetland somewhere else. Um, nature doesn't work real well when you take an upland and just to dig a hole and create a wetland. However, more commonly what people will do will restore wetlands. So wetlands that were maybe degraded, um, converted to agriculture, maybe the hydrology was changed sometime in the past. 
they tend to be pretty good at um, kind of, if you restore that, that flow, it all comes down to water again, restoring that hydrologic component to it, then you can get um, pretty good recovery of a lot of the wetland uh, functions within a system. So that's commonly done. Okay, thank you for that. Is, is filling in mosquito ditches a good idea? Oh gosh. <laughs> So this is, this is kind of a contentious issue if you're familiar with any of this work on this coast. So this mosquito ditches were made um, several decades ago for mosquito control um, to, to prevent breeding populations of mosquitoes on the coast. Um, they're very artificial and they, they've converted a lot of what used to be marshland along our coast into channels and then upland berms. Um, and so there is a lot of interest in regrading that and restoring that to, to wetlands. So, um, I mean, in general, in terms of like a carbon sink, this is a really great thing um, to get that wetland back to the right place within the tidal frame so that we can get that productivity back up and it will start functioning like a natural wetland and burying carbon. So in this, in this sense, it's maybe good for one reason and not so good for another reason, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, questions continue to roll in. Do you have any thoughts about why the carbon found at the uh, Fakahatchee site were so much higher than the other two sites in that Gulf Coast study? Yeah, um, yeah, if you're paying attention to the axes, the numbers at Fakahatchee are dramatically higher than the other two sites. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that these are very different systems. That was kind of the goal of the study. We wanted to pick, you know, some of the most different types of marsh to mangrove transitions and see, you know, how our patterns hold up across the landscape. So the first two sites, the Peace River and the Little Manatee River, these are kind of true rivers. Like you'd see a defined channel, you have tidal flow in and out of them. Um, and they had lower carbon storage, probably because they're more energetic systems. They're they're moving a lot more mineral sediment that's diluting that soil carbon. In Fakahatchee, it's the Everglades. It's that river of that river of grass. I mean, it is flat. It's hard to even call it a river because it's really just a gigantic marsh plain. And because of that, you know, it's super productive. The water is sitting there with lots of nutrients for long periods of time. Tons of primary productivity very, very little energy. I wouldn't even necessarily call it tidal. And so I think that the reason that um, that particular system has so much more carbon is again, it's wet more consistently, it's got higher productivity rates and it doesn't have the energy or the sediment to, to kind of move that carbon off the system. All right, well, thanks for engaging us and answering these questions. Unfortunately, we had to leave some questions on the table. Um, Dr. Chambers, I will reach out to you with, you with those questions and maybe somehow we can get the, the, them answered for people. Um, thanks very, very much again for uh, providing us this lunch lecture. Uh, it was such a great presentation. Um, I would like to thank everyone very much for attending uh, and hope that everyone else enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. And I'd like to remind everyone to please join us again uh, for our final Lunch on the Coast session for this uh, year, it will happen on Tuesday, December 7th at 12 p.m. Uh, and the title will be uh, Coast uh, Fish, What's on the Menu? Presented by Michelle Gaither, Associate Professor uh, of Biology. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chambers. Have a great day. Thank you.